We can take this anywhere you want to take it. Shock one, everyone. Carl Thomas. This is the first one I'm doing solo without Josh. Yeah. 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 So we had our farewells last week. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, so you're the trial. I want to see if I can do this in this capacity. Terrible, yeah, we might just fall in our ass. Yeah. <laughs> I do often. I'm always just like... I don't, what the fuck have I got to talk about? Really? <laughs> this is what every this is what everyone says though. But from doing this, like I've done this for nearly three years, mm. everyone I've spoke to is interesting. Yeah. And I mean, me and Josh garnered a pretty decent following of just talking to each other. You, your stuff's more interesting than you think it is. You know what I mean? And you guys are like, <laughs> did you do it like every week? Every week. Like one hundred and twenty six episodes. It's like that becomes like a. <laughs> Like when you're in a relationship and you have nothing. It's like, Dude, it's I'm like, going through a it's breakup not, right It's now. like you guys have amazing adventures every week. You're like, you never guess what happened to me. It's like, yeah, just fuck another week. The adventure, like, <laughs> yeah, the adventure was having the conversation about it because yeah. you need to feel the time. Yeah. And that gets interesting because you're like, well, but it's okay, something. well, but you would if you were sitting anywhere. Like if you were sitting together just having a beer, you're going to talk about something. Yeah. And then you realize that like the majority of the things you would talk about aren't too crazy you definitely cut it by 15 percent. i was gonna say this is the thing i'm like i'm always like Shit, what, what do i say what how cynical do i actually no but be? you're in a podcast so you're in a long t- you're in a long conversation which means you can't help but be yourself over that period of time but the problem is that you're a different person with different people mm-hmm. and me and you can go deep into a cynicism yeah. and a negativity yeah but we can also speak critically and and yeah. look at the world. So it's like you, you never know which version of yourself is going to show up. I, I worry that I'm just becoming way too cynical. Oh, 100%. Like, I think my romanticism of the world has taken a big hit over the last like five years. I think it comes down to age. Yeah. But like I watch movies now and I'm like, they don't make good movies anymore. And I'm like, oh, no, I'm old. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm and fully just, old. I'm trying to work out how much of your... How you, because when you, and this is the thing, like the naivety of when you, th- you just assume when you're younger that the way you see the world is pretty universal. Everyone sees it like me. Mm-hmm. And then you realize as you get older that like, well, hold on a second. It's not universal. And is that just me being a grumpy prick? Everyone else is like, what are you talking about, man? Well, it's great. Yep. Like, <laughs> like, but also then I was also thinking, I reckon it's there, I, I, there's, there's a connection for me at least. When you talk about like general cynicism and empathy, because as I've gotten older, as a father, I think my capacity for empathy has grown way bigger. Like I mm. care less about myself, more about others, more about the world at large, more about the world at large for my children. So then but that act, you know, like my cynicism is connected to that because more and more I'm looking at the world outside of myself and being like, no, it is kind of fucked. Like, yeah. And like that Because there's a, in a protective capacity, yeah. you're looking for problems, like you're looking for yeah, yeah. signs. So yeah. I'm building my Armageddon kit. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You become a prepper. <laughs> I, like, it, it's, I don't know if I'm talking about this. Did I tell you, like, I've read a thing theorizing about like when we fired up the Hadron Collider, are we sure that we didn't slip into a parallel universe when we fired it up? Because- it's around about then that everything started to turn to shit. Yeah, that's actually pretty <laughs> on point. I was like, point, yeah. fuck, that's kind of spot on. <laughs> but, um, you know, because like, and it was also like the, around about the time. Was that know, 2012? The Hadron, I don't know, actually. Oh, no, it was like 2008. Because when my roommate moved in, right. he was telling me about it. And yeah, I was like, oh, yeah. Yeah. Nerd. I think, <laughs> exactly. Of the people listening, like, what the fuck is that? No, no, I'm into it now. I was I born in 2000, mate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, but I was going to say, like, um, I forgot what I was going to say now. Um, like, the world, I mean, I had my first child in, what, two years before the whole pandemic and all that shit. Like, but my prepper, prepperism and my need to, like, fuck, I need to have land that I can grow food on. Mm. Just like all Primal these things needs, I never yeah. could have given a shit about. Like whatever, I'll go down to 24 hour IGA and spend 12 bucks on a fucking banana. You don't, I, like, I need land. <laughs> like, exactly. <laughs> I need land to grow food in case we can't get, like all these weird things started to, but also I think that like, you got to view that within the context of <laughs> what the last 
five years has looked like. I, th- I think people without children were probably also having similar thoughts to me, maybe less intense, but. You also be interesting as well, because I think you happen to have kids just before a major change in the world. Yeah. So to you, you'd be like, I had this when dad passed away. There was a major change in my world at that yeah. time, but it was kind of circumstantial. Like it all sort of just happened where I'd been doing nightclubs, running nightclubs for 12 years. He passed away. I was going through like a weird time in a relationship and it was just like, I also blew my knee out. Yeah, so yeah. on the back end of that mm. major event, which you could just cast down as going, dad died. I lost all my friendship group of basketball mates because I played four times mm. a week. And I, you just see them, they're, no, they're circumstantial no. friendships. You're still friends with them, but you're not, but you're seeing, not seeing them, them regularly exactly. because and you, you were working into life. Was. Exactly. Yeah. But you don't realize because this bomb comes and hits mm. having a child or, mm. you know, death in the family or something like that. And you attribute all of the other things that happen. You just kind of, they get pulled into that orbit and you're like, oh, that happened. And then the world changed. And it's like, no, it was a string of different it's a parts. Really, and it's a, it's a tricky thing to process, I reckon. All like just, I mean, I can definitely relate to, you know, that because I've had this overwhelming this is the stuff that I want to, this is the stuff that I, this is, I guess this is good. This is normally stuff that I don't get talk to talk about. about yeah. what is, or, but also like whether I want to talk about it publicly or not, you mm. know, like, um, cause it's, yeah, but fuck it, whatever. Um, this feeling of like change transition being just like thrust upon you. And it's something that I'd never, and I'm trying to work out like, is it, is it coincidental that it's happening to me at this age, you know, as I'm getting a bit older, maybe this happens to people who have to deal with heavy shit in their twenties. I don't know. But like, for me, I'm like, I can't get it over around this feeling that like the universe is just like, nah, man, shit's changing. Like just throwing shit at me. Old Once, life, new life. Yeah. And like, all like, you know, I'm, I've had a back, you know, I've had like this back injury for three years. So like, same thing within, a really short amount of time, like become a parent uh, when Willow's two or three, pretty bad, like back injury, you know, roses its head. And it's like, so then within a really short time, like I can't play basketball. I can't surf. I can't like all these things, like all the things that made, that make me me. I've just been like, no, nope, can't do You're anymore. Third, yeah. Yoink, you know yoink. about the third place? No. Uh, there's this, this th- a bunch of people talk about it, but there's the idea of men needing a third place. Okay. Like, probably women as well. I mean, it's probably just marketed to men, but the idea is that you have home, you have work, and then right. if you yeah. if you have a third place, you have good balance in your life. Yeah. And I know for you that was surfing. Definitely, yeah. And then when that's taken away through an injury, that's very hard to replace because you don't think of that as a – you think of that as something that you did that you can't do anymore – you don't go, what am I going to replace that with? Yeah. You just kind of pine in the space of it a little bit. Yeah. And, you, and it's so hard to recognize. Yeah. Yeah. I do. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's I, I never heard it. I never heard it, you know, expressed that way, but it's definitely true. Like, mm. and I am, I am aware of that because I've always known that like, but both surfing in particular, the basketball as well, are the only two activities and moments in life where my brain actually switches off to a degree because they're so, I mean, you know what basketball is like, it's so intensive mentally, physically that you, there's no, there's no bandwidth for any other thoughts no. to be there. You need a constant focus on Which a menial task. I think we're probably both so attracted to it. And like with surfing's the same thing mixed in with like, you know, nature and being in the ocean and all the mm-hmm. health benefits and being in the sun is great, but it's also incri- when it's big surface, I've particularly, you know, it's so physically and mentally demanding that I would, you know, I, I, you know, you know me, like definitely have, you suffer peaks and troughs of like, if you really want to call it depression, whether creative anxiety, whatever, mm-hmm. you know, times where I've gone, it's, you know, been so low and the only thing I know can think to do is like, fuck, I'll just go and get, I didn't want to go surfing. I'm such a bad mood, but I'll just go and get in the water. Yep. And then, I literally get out of the water and be like, I can't remember what I was angry about. 
Like I literally can't remember. Like it's so, and to not be able to do that on a regular basis, you get that kind of just accumulation of just like being just worn down mm -hmm. by, and you're not, you know, you never being able to um kind of fill the tank up, so to speak. You know what I mean? Everything, the way that I feel about it is everything becomes like a ball of cables. You know, you just have a, mm. that box that you chuck all the cables yeah, in yeah. and then no. you know everything's in there, but it's just like you start pulling at one and then it's connected to another. It's, and you, you, and when you are doing like, why something- Why do they even start? You, sorry? <laughs> why do they start? This? Exactly. My whole afternoon's gone now. <laughs> exactly. I'm doing this again. <laughs> yeah. But what, what I think like surfing was and basketball and stuff, it was like focusing on this one thing and it was almost just like- and all frag. It was just, yeah, it was just an yeah, allowing your mind to kind of order its thoughts yeah. in some way. Yeah. And, and um, rather than just being like compelled to try and address all of them at once and, and being like, overwhelmed. Meditation's meditation's good. You know, walking's good. Riding my bike's good. Pilates is good. But none of them are surfing. Yes. Yeah. You know, like they're just not even, they don't come close. <laughs> they're things that I'm doing that I'm like, this is okay. Yep. I'm doing it because I know I should do it. And it's it's good for my body, it's good for my mind, but it just there's not the same positive feedback loop that I get. And it's like And it doesn't stick. Like I did it with yeah, yoga exactly. for a while and I was like, maybe it's yeah. this. And then I was like, no, nah, I just it didn't stick. I I do it with gym, but my relationship with the gym is probably part of a negative feedback loop. Like it's just me being like, if you don't go, you're a piece of shit. Yeah. That's yeah. and that's that should be framed in a better way. Yeah. But it's not, I'm honest enough to say it's yeah, not yeah, like, yeah. I don't, but what I do know is That's that- That's kind of with Pilates. Yeah. It's like, you have to do this. This is the one. Yeah. When I, I know that when I leave, I feel better mm. because I can't, that voice in my head that says you're a piece, not you're a piece of shit. It's not like, it's not that bad, but it's like, it's come on, man, you're not living <laughs> up to, yeah. you're, you're not doing well. You could be doing well. You're not doing well. And when- that voice can't say that about me if I'm fit and healthy because I've been unfit. And it also doesn't because you've just got more endorphins. Right? If you, like, you, yeah. you know, it's a double, it's a, it's a, what's, I don't know how to state it, but like, yeah, it's, it also, but it does actually work. Like doing that stuff does, like going to Pilates does actually work. The, the natural endorphins I get from exercising do equate to more positive self-talk. Yeah. Whether I like it or not. But it's like, that. but I don't wake up and can't wait to get fucking Pilates today. It's going to be sick. Like, don't they stalk you on the back end though when you don't go? Don't those thoughts oh, of like, don't they yeah. go, why didn't you go to Pilates, you piece of shit? Yeah. Um, look, I've, I've gotten real comfortable with being a piece of shit <laughs> internally. I'm like, whatever. I can't get... <laughs> the thing is, you have two, so you have two children. I don't have time. Yeah, exactly. Where you're like, Oh, the, that's a pretty good immediate litmus test. It's like they're alive and happy. Exactly. Okay, so I'm not. I can't and they possibly are good for that. Shit. that. Like, whether you want to, you could, you could talk about not having time to reflect on being a piece of shit, or actually that they just, you know, for better or worse, sometimes having kids is amazing. I had a great day with them today. Sometimes it's so fucking hard and punishing. Oh, like it's it's really. Hard sometimes, and like either or. Again, it's like you want to talk about bandwidth. <laughs> like when I'm with the kids today, like there is, it's like basketball and surfing. There's no bandwidth for me to be worrying. I, I don't. My depression kind of got so much better when I had kids because I just didn't have time. There's no to space be for it. My you don't have time to stare into the abyss yeah. and 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 ponder negative thoughts. Yeah, that was the biggest issue that I had because. I realize I've said this before in here, but mm. I realized that like my brother and my sister, we all went through the same tragic event mm -hmm. of dad dying and we all took it hard, but we dealt with it in different ways. And I, I just found myself in a very, very deep hole and it's because I had the luxury to be there. Like uh, financially, I was doing fine. I didn't have any physical responsibilities. Yeah. My brother had to go to work. Like he had to, he had a wife and he had a mortgage, he had all those things. He had to go had to back to the mines. The structure has and to he can't, keep going. he can't be thinking about that there because yep. people die in the role that he was in. And then you have, um, 
my sister had a young boy. Yeah. Same. And she's like, same. I can't, like, I have to get out of yeah. bed in the morning. Exactly. And yeah. it, that, that does say a lot for, like, this, this having the space. Like, mm. they always say, I mean, idle hands, the devil's playground, that sort of thing, and misery loves company. But, like, the idea is, I think, for me, is that there is a healthy balance of looking into that abyss and seeing if you can shine some light on it and maybe understand yeah. it a little bit more. And then there's other times where it's like, you sh it, it's there, we're aware I mean, it's the there, other, but we need to keep doing this. you got to recognize also that the other thing at play is, and you and I have this in common, is that our professions involve no one telling us, like complete self Reliance, self-indulgence, self-dependence, self-motivation, right? If you don't like, I mean, you'll have a client that'll be like, what the fuck, man? You missed a deadline, whatever. But like, other than, you know. It's it's no, generally my own. No one's forcing you to go to work at a certain time or what, no. right? But also, <laughs> your work involves you coming into a room and sitting by yourself <laughs> for long hours. Mm -hmm. with, your, with nothing but your own thoughts. Yep. And so then trying coming you, out with something and being like, do you like it? And and even if you so even if you did like you know you're going through through you know your dad passing away, and even even if you were like no I'm going to get up I'm going to be at work at eight a.m. every day, you just come in and go through the same stuff here by yourself. Yes, you be like oh, yeah you're at work, but like there's no there's no distraction. Mm -hmm. You know, like I've become really fond of like distraction in life. Like it's such a great thing for mental health. Like mm. whether you, how you depending on how you want to frame it, like you could you could frame it as like I mean we've you know there's times when like this probably happened with us where it's like you're supposed to go and you know meet someone for a coffee or whatever, and you're in a lone mood. You're like I don't want to fucking talk to anyone, and then you go and do it because you don't want to be a prick, but then you realise that oh, actually that was uh, that was actually really good. Not necessarily because what was said was in particularly profound. Because it I feel just, better. It was just a distraction from yourself, mm -hmm. you know? And like, you're not going to solve those problems. Yeah. But, you know, sitting in a room, you see, especially when you're just trying to white knuckle through, you're not yeah. going to solve those problems. So getting a little bit of space and maybe realizing that they're not like as end of days as you are making them out to be, that was like a big thing that I realized. I did, You were a really important it's, part of this, actually. I went to, um, when I was in London, man, you went and, had dinner yeah. accidentally at some like really fancy place that we didn't. Was it um? Was it Shoreditch House? No, it was. Oh. We we did that, but it was one oh, that me and you just Hackney. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. was like not very good. Yeah, yeah but it was like, <laughs> it was like yeah, they were coming out with tiny dishes yeah, yeah. of like <laughs> six pieces of spaghetti and being like, "This is the." That yeah, was yeah. crazy. Yeah, but that day I've never wanted to go and meet anyone less. I was in a yeah, and I because I was yeah. devastated because I knew I'd had like. And everyone knows this, like at the, when I started this podcast, like I was in a real bad headspace yeah. mentally. And then I'd started to get, start, started to rebuild a little bit, but I was like, I'd never been fragile. I'd, I'd never considered myself to have a fragile mind before. Yeah. But at, at that period, like going through a breakup, dealing with the death of dad, like yeah, just yeah. a lot of stuff, it, for the first time it kind of snapped and I was like, yeah. It scared the shit out of me because I was like, I'm not of sound mind and I yeah. always have been and I was 38 years old. Yeah. So I started to kind of pull myself out of that and build and rebuild, which was yeah. a, that was, it, it's just something you, that happened. When you went, so that's when you entered Barcelona, yeah? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and yeah. so after a little while, I'd sort of found my footing and I was like, okay, well, let's go and see who I am when I'm not here yeah. and how I work. Yeah. And, and if I want a sea change, whatever I want to do. And I got there. I'd been in Barcelona. It was fantastic. And then I got to London and it was, it was a beautiful summer heat wave. Yeah. It was like the hottest. Yeah, I remember that. It was, it was absolutely gorgeous. Great time to be there. First summer after their lockdowns. Yep. So everyone That's was good. in a great mood. There was a lot of really positive sort of feelings going on. And I was riding it was a city bike to a WeWork in um, shortage and I was just like I had been doing this work I had so much money I had more money than I'd had for in my adult life I was in London I was just completely free to do whatever I wanted I just felt like I'd been given a lottery ticket and I got hit with this overwhelming 
feeling of depression. Like we, because I, I'd been diagnosed with depression. So, yeah. but every time, it, every time that cycle, especially when it's extreme, because it, they can just point at you and say, you've got depression. But when you're in a moment or, or a, uh, for me, it's usually like a week where the energy just gets sucked out of you and you feel like you could fall asleep anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you just kind of sit down and there's this total lack of any feeling that happened while I was riding a bike and it, it hit me so fucking hard because I was like, fuck, this is in my head. This isn't, yeah. this wasn't yeah. circumstantial to where I was. I can't get away from this. And like I'm not, in and literal it, paradise it's, it's exactly, right now. Exactly, yeah. And that and, and it and it fucked me up because I was staying with my but cousin. That is a scary concept when you're like, oh, I've so Yeah, circumstances are relevant. Yeah. It fuck it, great. Drilled <laughs> me. So the <laughs> yeah. weight of that yeah. um was was pretty crazy. And then I I had to go and then tell my cousin and his girlfriend that I had depression because I wouldn't, yeah. I never told, like, I didn't have to, I didn't have to address that, but I was living with them. So I was yeah. like, yo, I've just kind of deal with this. And that was cool. But it's like a sense of like, I, I can, I'm trying to, it's almost like a sense of futility. You know, like, well, what's the point? Yeah. Like, if I'm, like I can do, I can do all the right things. Mm -hmm. And then. Yeah. Like, not for, like I, which I, I, which I relate to sometimes. Yeah. The thing is though, you do realize after a while that, that's okay. Like it's devastating the first few times because you just like that meme where you just throw in the papers and being yeah. like, fuck this. Yeah. And you're like, well, exactly. It's futile. Da da da. And that's just a bit of a bratty instinct. Yeah. It's just like a, oh no. Like, yeah. and now I have to deal with this. It's like, fuck that. It's just something that I have to deal with. And as I've got better at dealing with it, where and the only way I got better at dealing with it is that shit would calm, that feeling would calm. And I would go, uh, that's here. And I treated it exactly the same way as the flu. I was yeah, like, just chill. Cool. Your yeah. only thing you need to do is go to like exercise was the only thing I had to do. Yeah, just It's like, you can do goes. nothing all day. Clients, it, nothing matters because you can't do it. Yeah. Like showing up and trying to do it. And then I, yeah. then I broke it down to like two, three day stretches, maybe like mm. once every four months. Mm. And then now it's like, now it's a feeling. And I go, okay, let's take the day off. Yeah. That's, and then that's it's gone. Like it's, it's just, recognize that. yeah. But yeah. It, it, man, that was a many years of like, yeah. because you, it was such an alien feeling to even to go in and, and get a diagnosis. Like was, I, I tried everything first. Like I got a, all the blood tests, yeah. hair samples, everything. I was like, do I, cause I thought I was sick. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, cause of the physicality of it and just yeah. the lack yeah. of energy. Yeah. But, no, nah, like these days, it's so much easier. I, I think that was why I was a bit scared of letting go of doing the podcast as well, because the podcast really was such a big lift yeah. to guide me out of it yeah, and have yeah. conversations and connect me to people that when Josh said he didn't want to do it anymore, I was like, there was this big feeling of panic inside yeah, me where I was, sure. and I didn't know what it was. I was like, what the fuck is this? Like, yeah. that's a strain, because I understood his reasons, mm. but I was like, whoa, why am I feeling like yeah. so uneasy about yeah. this? But when we, the, the point was that I was making was that we went to that restaurant, I showed up and I died. I was dying. I was yeah. dying. And I remember showing up and I was, I was very, I felt embarrassed, even though we were really good friends. I, I was like, I don't want people to see me like this. Yeah. And it was, I'd made a monster out of it, but I was talking to you about it and you said, just to take your hands off the wheel. Like you don't oh, yeah. need, and, yeah. and normally I hear things that sound cliched and you just go cliche. That's just what someone says when they're uncomfortable. Because I know you really well, I thought about it, and you were like, "The wheel." The, my takeaway from it was like, "The wheels." We're not sure that it's connected to anything. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah, it's it's not, like you, it's you're trying hard. so hard to yeah. keep to to keep things on track and so It's like, what if that didn't? What if that's a, a lie? Yeah, you know. And you do like because that that's if there's one thing that parenthood thrust upon me it's that it's like i can't it's just you try to like i exerted i did you know exert you know imagine you think that's that you think that's what got you to where you are this ripping and just i had for you know for god literally what 10 years at least 
15 years of my life, like blinkers on, like one track, shock one is what I do. Mm -hmm. Music, you I'm know, I'm going like, to make it. I'm going to make, this is like, I, I, I don't, I've said this to many a student, like I didn't, there was no plan B. This is, and also and just, you know, general youthful drive and whatever, mm -hmm. like, but. But it was there and you could write yeah. it. You were like, yep. Yeah, and full foot, and you definitely, you know, like some of that was like spite. For yep. People, for, you know, people who bullied me and like, yep. hi, you know, I'll fucking show you world. Yeah. All these they never thought of you again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. yeah. It's like, but like, I thought that that's, I mean, I, I'll never know. Like, I, you know, I had this perception that that was what got me to where I was going. Like, and I, you know, achieve, I've achieved things in my life that I never thought possible, you know, like, um, feel it's like very lucky to have, you know, done this for so long. But I often wonder if I could have, I see other people who seem to be able to do it with a bit more grace and a bit more balance in their life. And they kind of like, you know, I feel for my, my partner, Asha, like the amount of times where like, I'd say, you know, dinner at a parent's house on a Friday and I'd get there like, I don't know, not that, I'd get there half an hour late. I'm like, where have you been? I'm like, oh, I was just working on a snare drum. Like, yeah. And she just said, like, yeah, like she was so patient. And I look mm. back now and I'm like, I was a bit of a dick. Like I was so self-involved. And all of but that. that's what it takes. That yeah. is what it takes. And it it takes an understanding partner for yeah. that. Yeah. Because if if you were if she was a police officer, you'd have a whole bunch of things to deal with where she's like, yeah. oh, I can't come home because I'm stuck at a yeah, crime right, scene. So kind of, she's a midwife. It, she is like, when Ash has got to go to work, she's got to go to work and she's, it's a full on job. You yep. know what I mean? And if something goes up with the birth, then she's not home for a while. And it's like, that's just what it is, you know, like. Um, and no one can touch you. No one can talk to you and ask you. That's the worst thing about the, the jobs that we do is like, at any point, someone can call you and be like, can you do this? Because I like I know that you can. Yeah. Like I know that you have the ability. Like you're not doing open heart surgery. <laughs> right? And you're like, yeah. you don't take my heart seriously. <laughs> oh man, we just we have had this conversation many times. We've gotten better at communicating over the years. Like, but it's like it is that thing of like I just had to learn. You know, when our first child was born, like it's a you know it's a multitude of things like learn to like be less self-important, be less self-involved, but also learn that the world won't implode if I'm not at the studio every single day, mm. 10 hours doing the thing. Like, don't get me wrong. Like it's, there's, there's challenges involved in balancing both lives, big challenges, particularly when it comes to touring. I just spent a month away, you know, in Europe for, for the summer festivals and stuff. And that's, the hard on Asha more than anyone. You know, she's got a two-year-old and a six-year-old on her own for a month, and I'm I feel hugely guilty. But it's like, but it's we. This is what I do. Like, and yeah, it's your working on the minds essentially. Like, yeah, I mean, in the sense of it yeah. requires you to be there. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, and like this has been going. This is how we make money. And, I, and it's like now I'm. I try to. We were just having a conversation at dinner before I came here about when we're going to go to the zoo. <laughs> like whether we're going to go this Thursday or next week, but next week it's going to be like off its dial because it's school holidays. We might like just beat the school holidays. We go this Thursday, but like I kind of need to be at work and I'm trying to work out where I can pick up the extra hours in the studio because I've got tunes to make and deadlines to meet. You know, it's like it's a constantly evolving challenge that I've learned is um, just really requires calm communication. Yeah. Because I, I did. Get, you guys learn that? Oh yeah. Was, Rather, yeah. It, that, that's like, not like a given. That's no, that's a, is, that's something that needs particularly on tweaking. my like I on my end. It's been I have a tendency to get real like like you just said like you don't respect my art and my time and like you think I can just do this super quick and like yeah. and I, I I kind of I don't know if defensive is maybe it's more accusatory or more, like where like you just think that the other person. It thinks your job's really easy or yeah. something, you know? And, and then they, you get heated and it's like, okay, now we're on other sides. Yeah, and you, exactly. It gets, um, what's the word? Like um, Combative. Exactly. Yeah. When it's like learning, that's the thing that 
you, you need to learn to be like, it's not we're on the same team here. We just got to work out how to manage our time and our days. And like, and each every everyone has, I think every any parent any parents where like both people are working. Just just like understanding that that person needs that thing for them to be them. Yes. You know, and that, that you can't expect the other person to just um just be a, the parent and you get to go like because it is easier to go to work. It's so much easier yeah. to get up and you go and get your coffee and you can drink your coffee in peace and then you can just like focus on your work. You know, like and I'm I'm definitely guilty of like probably burdening Asha with the the parenting side of things in the in the past, I think. Um, where, cause I was just so, again, caught up in my own doing this thing and probably like being a bit selfish in the sense that like hiding behind my work a bit mm -hmm. when I'm, when I'm actually just like, oh, being a parent is really hard. Oh. <laughs> like, yeah. You know, yeah. Like, I did that a lot when I was, when dad was got first got sick, I signed a record deal with mm -hmm. one love and I was working on music and that was the perfect disguise yeah. to go and sit in a room and be terrified. Yeah. And like, so people were like, can you do this? It's like, no, I'm working on, I'm working on music was like, and people understood it because I was trying to do something. The greatest excuse But I wasn't life. doing it. it. I, I was it just life. sitting there just yeah. like frozen in this yeah. shit. And it's like people, so then people kind of think that you, and for, for my sense, it was like friendship groups felt like I had gone, I do music now, like mm -hmm. fuck you. But realistically, I was just going, I don't know how to deal with what's going on. Yeah. This is the only place people leave me the fuck alone. It's a I, great, it's a great, I, I mean, it's, it's a great excuse. Creative, I think creative people use it all the time. Great the excuse. thing is, you still need to do the creative thing. Yeah, definitely. Otherwise, you're going to get but found out. if you out. are doing the creative thing, like you can't, like I'm, a lot of artists just don't want to deal with like real life. Mm. They've, and they're like, well, I don't want it because I'm an artist and I, I can't because it's just, it's too demanding. And, and then you realize that it's a job like anything else. Yeah. And regardless of how like mystical it feels, yeah. you still need to do the same shit that 90% of people do in their job. Exactly. And yeah. you're going to hate it at times. Yeah. Have you ever found yourself in a position where there is something extremely heavy to pick up and you do not have the physical attributes to be able to manage it? I have. I know Scott has. And if you find yourself in a similar predicament, you should reach out to Jackson Moore at Perth Fork Trucks. These boys have been servicing the Perth Fork Trucking industry for over a decade? Maybe more. I don't know. It's been a long time. We don't have that information. They are experts, though. You can guarantee that. Go to perthforktrucks.com.au. The link is going to be down in the description below. Or reach out to Jackson Moore. We have a new sponsor. Uh, Le Bon Cookies. Did I swear? You can probably swear in the ad read. <laughs> if you like New York style cookies, which are crispy on the outside and half-baked dough on the inside, then get around Le Bon Cookies, who are a new podcast sponsor. They've got stores in Cottesloe and Frio. For the guys, I, I'm so terrible at these. This is fucking insane. <laughs> if you're looking for a good gift to buy for your girlfriend or wife, I think they love cookies. They do love cookies. If you're an unthoughtful boyfriend and you've forgotten to get your girlfriend a gift, Jesus f <laughs> Girls like cookies and murdered TV shows and those things go together perfectly. So if you're looking for a gift, buy them some Le Bon cookies. You can get them delivered to your house, even if you don't live in WA, or you can go in store and grab them. The packaging's great, the branding's great, the cookies are great. It's all good. All of this is good. <laughs> Every part of what they do is good. <laughs> I recently quit nicotine and I am now going to just gouge myself on New York style cookies. <laughs> Visit them at La Bomb Cookies on Instagram. That's L-A-B-O-M-B -B cookies. La Bomb Cookies are good. I love it. Uh, I think I got enough. Do you have a fat pig girlfriend? <laughs> <laughs> and hating it makes you feel like a... It comes with its own extra and set of challenges because you you're like, and you also need to be a grown up. Yeah, and like just fucking the life deal with actual life stuff, like you whether it's you know, your kids or your parents or like your family. You can't like, like how many artists do you know that have just like they go, oh, I'm I'm an artist, I'm setting off around the world, and I don't see my parents for 
five years or something. Mm. Like, you know, and it's like, and I'm not, there's no, like, that sounded judgy, but like, it's. Well, it's it's a selfish, ind- it's what it, it takes. It's just, yeah, exactly. And it, it is what it takes. It is a selfish endeavor. Um, but it's not, a, I don't think it starts as a selfish endeavor. I think it starts as a idealistic view of the world. And then you get to hold on to that idealistic yeah. view because it, the world is working for you. Yeah. And you go, well, I, it's hard to take advice from other people because you're like, well, I'm, I'm fucking doing this and it's the path less traveled and I don't really know how to keep this fucking thing. And it's, it's, there's, uh, it's, I definitely have had like, it's, <laughs> it's never thought about this before. This is great. See, stuff comes up. Um, like the pride that you take, almost self righteousness in like, yeah, I'm traveling the path. Let's try. Mm. I jumped in the deep end. Like, how good am I? Yeah. Like, you know, and it's just like, it's a brat. It's, it's a, a brat. It's a full, brat. Like, yeah, like, yeah, you did. And you were also blessed to have had the, for the universe to respond. Yes. So lucky that the universe said, okay, actually, yeah, that's good enough. And the circumstances to incubate that. Exactly. And don't get me wrong, you deserve all the credit, and I genuinely give you the credit as someone I know really well for fucking doing it and having recognizing the talent and then having the hard work to do it. It's, it's, it's always like a saddening shattering of the fourth wall when you become friends with people that you respect and you realize that their lives aren't just the most perfect. Yeah, yeah. You know what yeah, I mean? Like, totally, yeah. I think that's something if you learn that I would instill on everyone and if I ever end up having kids, like try and realize real early that like everyone is a normal person. I remember I was like 26 and working in LA and I met like, Steve Aoki and DJ AM and the Cobra Snake and all these people that I'd only seen on the internet. And they weren't like monsters, but they were like, I was like, oh, they, their lives must be this. And I got to know them on, you know, I, I met them enough that I knew that yeah. their lives, they worked fucking hard. Yeah. And they, they didn't work hard, like doing fun shit. They worked hard. Yeah. You know, making sure the scaffolding was being built around what they were doing. And I was like, that's not. You can't fucking watch Netflix and do that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And also, like, I'd be, I think what's also bratty is if, for like, someone like myself, like, the, my, like, my family, like, like, my parents, how much, I mean, we both owe them 100% a gratitude. Like, you know, how do we, <laughs> and we shorten shorten a whole childhood lifetime to explain. Like, I think that there was your dad created, or certainly from my perspective, your dad created an outlet for kids that wanted to do. It was actually, it was mum and dad. Mum, yeah, yeah. No, mum, yeah. dad built the building. Mum created the youth music workshop programs that they mm-hmm. ran, and she ran them, and she got the government funding. And dad bought a warehouse for his PA company, but built a second story in and built a freaking tv studio in there that me and my friends were the hosts of that was you know like just this you look at all the people that they brought together like i never i never would have met the guys from pendulum if it wasn't for their actions in the community um i never would have met you because you wouldn't have been rehearsing downstairs Mm -hmm. in the the rehearsal i recorded with you the first record i ever recorded was with your band in that room yeah right yeah like all of that like yeah, it's, it's always this snowballing effect of like people meeting each other that like that put me in a position in the universe to be able to be successful. And also being able to see them, and this was this was really important, I think, was to be able to see that DIY mentality of like going, oh, you can do that. Like I saw your dad put on concerts. Yeah. Now my mom ran a theater company. And um, used to put on like touring theater shows of like Oliver Twist and stuff, but it would go down south and there'd be a bus yeah, yeah, and yeah. it would have a full cast and it would have, and and she did that. She built a theater company. And so for me growing up, it was like, oh yeah, you can do stuff. Yeah. Like you can create stuff and that will put people in a room. And yeah. I had no concept. I wasn't thinking about money, but I was like, you can have a vision and then see it come to life. And that, I am forever grateful for that and because it changes huge, your um, whole perspective of the world. I'm not a, you know, like, I don't like to use the word because it has 
um, I can't even think of the word right now, um, manifestation. Mm -hmm. You know, like I'm not, I'm, I'm a, I'm a skeptic when people talk about manifestation. Like Ash has recently got, my partner's recently got into it quite a bit. And I'm like, it's funny how they, how these things work. But like one thing that I've, the concept of manifestation is that for it to work, you need to, your subconscious needs to see things in real life in a, like it has to believe that they're doable. Yeah. Yeah. And seeing them be done. So you saw that mm -hmm. happen. It made it, you know, <laughs> for me, like, again, growing up in, um, you know, in live music and like, I, I understood that like, there was not, there was nothing, um, like mysterious about it. Yeah. It was just like, it's just, I, I saw dad <laughs> loading PAs in and out of PAs at, in, at mm. you know, out of pubs at two in the morning. Yeah, like it was this a very, is normal. This is a very normal, this is very, this is just work. So I always had this kind of like, I guess very un, um, majestic approach to music it's just work mm -hmm. you just do the work and stuff will happen it's, it's as simple as that like and then to see like one of the things the really big things i think for me was to see robin gareth of pendulum achieve the fame that they like achieve like proper fame yeah that made i realized now my subconscious went oh okay totally doable I spoke to Ian Strange about totally it. Totally doable. Like, he and was so like, it's, I it's saw a, friends do it. There's a, there's a literal pathway right there. Mm -hmm. And so, so then you just do it. And, it and, and all of a sudden, things just lay, start laying out in front of you. And I was like, I was having this conversation with a student just last week where like, you know, there was a time, probably around about the time when like the pendulum guys were first putting their first singles out where for me, like to have one, and I've def definitely said this to you before, like to have one record, you know, one release on vinyl, single release on vinyl was like, that was the end game. <laughs> you know, that was like, if I can do that, I have made, made it. it. I've done it. And then I did it pretty quickly. And like, and I was like, okay, shit. Okay. Now I have to do another one. I need a B side and I've got nothing. So yeah, but it went on and, you know, to get a song played on Triple J. Again, impossible. It, that was such a, for us, mm -hmm. you know, like think about like yep. us in Kingsley, Woodvale, Hillary's in the northern suburbs of Perth to be like, to be played, to be on high rotation on Triple J. Is insanity. That is you couldn't even conceive that. Right? That. Yeah. And then it kind of, it just, thanks to Ian Strang, actually, <laughs> um, happens, you know. Um, and then, you know. How did that happen through Ian? I don't know. So my song, Polygon, um, Ian was actually, it was when Ian was in, this is Ian Strange, the artist, so this picture I'm looking at right there. <laughs> um, he was in Sydney with that, when was he, he was meeting that guy that changed everything for him. What was his name? Oh, uh, yes. Yes. He spoke about him on this podcast. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, his name yeah, will come One, back one of the him. godfathers yeah. of street art. Yeah. So, so it's when, when he was in Sydney kind of making his moves, I released the EP that Polygon was on and I did a like a little an EP launch at Shape and you know it was pretty small chips and I it's not like I'd written not like I was like this is it I've written the breakthrough song at all um quite the opposite in fact I was like man I hope this if this doesn't do something like maybe I need to get a job yeah, yeah like this is, I've been doing this a while now anyway, how long have you been doing it at that point huh how long had you been doing so that it that was point? 2000. I'd been doing Shock One for five years at that point. And you'd been playing shows and stuff. Yeah, I'd be like, don't my, I, literally, like my first single came out in 2000. My, th my first single came out in 2005. And I'd been doing it for about a year and went, until my first single came out and Polygon came out in 2009. Yep. So I was five, about five years into Shock One. Still, Still working, working part -time jobs. Still Cos Cosmic. At the time, I was. Actually, no, I lost my job at Cosmic because I went on a I went over to Europe to play some shows that I didn't make any money on, but I had an opportunity to go and play in Holland. So I went, yeah, I'm doing it. it. Wasn't a job for me when I came back. So I was back in Perth paying my rent on my credit card. <laughs> Literally just like, I have no How old? Twenty seven? Yeah. I'm not young. You know, like and I was like, I don't have this is it. Like that was when this is the whole plan B thing. 
that was when my plan B would have gone into effect. Definitely. But you just didn't, you just didn't, didn't have, have one. one. <laughs> you just no, like, oh, fuck. Like, I've spoken to my, my mum said that was the time when she was just like, because she's always been 150% supportive of, of just, you know, um, going for music, you know? And that was the only, she said, she was like, oh, shit, maybe I've stuffed it up here. Like, maybe he's not got it. No, not going to yeah. make it. Like, but, and this is, this is those things of like planets aligning, whatever, like, Strang, without even talking to me, he went on the Triple J forums, which existed then, and literally just made a thread saying, like, went to Shock One's EP launch last night, just to be a good friend. He designed the artwork for the for the EP, just to be a good mate, be like, went to Shock One's EP, which was a lie, because he was in Sydney and I was in Perth. Um, best thing ever, this guy's going to be massive. Just, what a legend. Just made a thread on their forums, bigging me up. And then, he, and then I get an email from Ian, and he's like, Hey man, I don't know if I've like stuff up any of your like marketing plans. I'm like, there's no marketing plan, dude. Like, I got, I got like, an express re- advert. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, the marketing plan was the EP launch. That's it. Like, um, and because he was like, Richard Kingsmill was replied to my to my forum post, like, and he wants to get in contact with you and hear the EP. I hope I don't. I'm like, what? You've got Richard Kingsmill's email? He's like, yeah. So I just emailed um richard and who was the director of triple j at the time um musical director and um i was like hey i heard you want to get in i heard you wanted to hear the ep my friend here's here it is and he's like yeah sweet i'll give it a spin on like the whatever it was like the good nights or whatever it was no yeah. it was 2009 like oh, sunday yeah, night no shit, when he did yeah. that like new music show on a sunday night played it on that then it got a spin on it wasn't good nights this was before good nights it was like request fest or something yeah one of those like, yeah um and it was everyone listened to that station oh, that was like that was when it w- was truly culturally relevant mm, you know truly yeah and within like a week it was the most requested song on triple j i remember, I remember coming in above calvin harris one night like it was that yeah, calvin wow. harris better if i see a light shining that, yeah. that, i love that song <laughs> and, that, and then like that had the top three most requested songs you know and I was like, and, and my song hadn't been played that night. And I remember I was driving to basketball at Perry Lakes and I remember sitting in the car park because I was just about to like, I had a late game and they were just about to do the like top three requested. And I was sitting there in the car and like my song was like the most requested song on Triple J, which is just bonkers. That is, yeah, that's insanity. I just, I don't know if I've like, that's one of those moments where I was like, I mean, I also remember when it got played on Triple J, sitting at my girlfriend at the Times house on a Sunday night, like hearing my song on the radio on Triple J was just so out of this world. You know, just all these things that seemed, you know, this is a very long way of getting to a point, um, <laughs> like that seemed impossible. You know, add to that, like even just the concept of writing one full length album was a mountain that I just never thought I could climb. Took me a very, took me three and a half years to do it. But then for that to like be at the top of the ARIA charts, just like, Come on. Yeah. And so that period of ascension from that single release. That was 2009 to 2013. Yeah. Like, and you were still servicing? You were still dropping singles or did you just? I, yeah, I was teasing. Like, I'm <laughs> like, um, like releasing singles off the album. Like I Before put Crucify Me Out and three years later my album came out. Yeah, yeah. Me Out. Like I was like just literally head above water. <laughs> um. But you just know, trying to stay relevant in, in that scene where you're like, oh, these people need to hear me. Hubs are like, shit, I better write some dubstep for the album. Like, um, but like what I what I realized was, um, you know, this is where like the, the motivational tagline comes in. Like the, okay, so what else is impossible? Mm. All of these, like, okay, I've proven to myself repeatedly that these things that are, they're just nothing but like, perspectives and frameworks yep. that I think uh, you know, um, what's possible, what's not impossible, what am I good enough to do? Oh, that seems really hard. I can't do it. But it's just like literally, again, sounds like a cliche. There's a one foot in front of the other. Just going to work every day. Yeah. Do it and it becomes it. possible. And, something, and the opportunities present themselves. Yeah. I've always said that. I'm like, if it's good, it's going to be fine. But again, it's not just me. Mm. Where I'm coming from is like all of these things only came it's, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants, my giants being my incredibly supportive parents and my sister and like being in this environment where 
I was never, ever told, and I feel truly blessed for this. I was never, ever told like, come on, get a real job. Like that's not going to happen. Yeah. The only time I was ever it's, told that was in high school from like a guidance counselor. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's a stupid idea. What do you want to be? A rock star? No, not going to happen. Cool. Thanks. Fuck you. I'm doing it anyway. Like, yeah. I literally said to them, like, somebody's got to be the next Dave Grohl. Why can't it be me? Like, yeah, why yeah. can't it? Exactly. And, and you like, need that mentality. You need that mentality, to, but you need the belief that, like, anything the, is possible. The only thing that enabled me to, to have that mentality and that belief for a continued amount of time was the fact that I went home from that day at school um, where I was like, what the fuck are you, man? Like, you know, literally, like, that's not, they're just, they're saying, and I just, to this day, I'm like, what are you doing as a guidance counselor? Like, that's just not going to happen, dude. Like, mm. what are you, the chances, you do realize that that's never going to happen. Like, and I, to be able to go home and talk to my mom about that conversation and for her to be like, screw that guy, get on your drum set, go do it right now. You know, like, to have that for both my parents to be like, they're full of shit, you have everything it takes, you know, to have that. that. Instilled in you. Yeah. And so you're like, oh, if your parents can instill that blind faith in you, which I think is your job as a parent. It totally is. 100, you know, like, um, but not law, not all parents, I, you know, not all parents like that. Like, No, I think that that generation, I think the hippier side of that of our pen- yeah, parents' our generation parents had it. Are, yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. And that's that's important because I think if you came out of, It'll be interesting to see what happens with kids that are born in the next 10 years if we do go into a serious kind of yeah, downfall yeah. and then come back out. Because it's, it's just yeah, it's cyclical. easy for us to say because we- You'd be like, get a most... fucking, make sure you do something where you can get a job, otherwise you're going to be homeless. We didn't and... grow up in post-war London. Exactly. Yeah. But, uh, but then again, I mean, well, our parents London, fucking, like... our, our parents were born to- a yeah. generation that had yeah. just been through. They were the, hell. This is the thing, but they, they, our parents grew up in the in the period of like prosperity, the post-war prosperity. I think so. Yeah, the, they were born into the post-war yeah. pros- prosperity. Like, like their, our grandparents are definitely more stoic and yeah, but they because yeah because they saw the world fall to shit, and their parents major, saw it even worse. Like uh, their parents were in World War One, exactly right. And then a depression, so, like, the Spanish so we flu, got like the benefit, the incredible benefit of growing up in maybe one of the most prosperous times in all of Western dude eighties and nineties has got to be like the, human history, right? Yeah. The 80s and 90s has to be the most insane period of prosperity in yeah, humankind. And just like talk about like that, va- like value systems being crazy warped. Really, if you look at like the history of humans mm. and like the 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 privilege that our generation essentially has, you know, and our parents and our generation, like this thing of like just the entire notion of what we're talking about of like live your dream. Go yeah. for it. That is not I think a- we were the first live your dream yeah. generation and it wasn't shouted from the rooftops. It was it was a marketing ploy for, for the most part. Like yeah. it was like you would see that on adverts and things yeah. like that and the media was pretty controlled. But I think that like our parents' generation before, especially women, it was like you can't do this, yeah. you can't do that. Yeah. And they, they were like, I think we actually fucking can. Yeah. And they started to get like- Definitely, yeah. And that in, that influence, because then you would have two parents that could potentially say that yeah. and mean it, like say yeah. with the chest, you know what I mean? Yeah, 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 Whereas yeah. like, I think in the generations before, it must've been crazy because our great grandparents' generation, I think it was our great grandparents. I saw that meme and it was like, if you were born- like in the 1920s or something, basically you just went through your life. Oh yeah. That's and it, it was just pure hell. <laughs> yeah. It was just a constant beating. We're whinging about COVID and you look at that. So yeah, that's exactly. when it came out. Exactly. Yeah. That was, yeah. Cause I had, what did they have? Like World War One, Spanish then, flu, Spanish great flu, depression, great depression. Well, <laughs> World War II. Like Jesus Christ. Yeah. And then they would have all expected because the Cuban missile crisis happened at the exact yeah. time, the exact distance from World War Two. That World War Two did from World War One, so they were just like, "Um, oh, here's Here we the, go again. the yeah. third cycle of this, yeah, and it's just going to be even more horrific." Yeah, so I think that's where the hippie movement. I, it would have been crazy to see if the hippie movement worked. I know, right? Because that was a that they wanted to change, yeah, the way that humans interact 
on a global scale. They were mm. like, we're not going to go to war. We're pacifists. Yeah. We're not going to work. We're just going to fucking forage and yes. do drugs yeah. and have sex. And if that took hold stronger, mm. yeah, it would be pretty crazy to see. Because it definitely made an it's made a huge impact on the way the world is now with like um you know like legalization of weed definitely that was yeah like and not only that like the whole i mean you had was it nixon that started the war on drugs no it was um after him cuz remember it was what's Reagan. his name's wife reagan's wife was like just say no yeah i mean you like we've all seen all the, the documentaries about like kind of the research into and mdma and psilocybin and all of those things and how it just went to, yep. you know, it was making great leaps and bounds and then just completely stopped. And now only just is starting to like start being recognized again as like, actually, this is kind of good for people with like serious mental stuff going on, like yeah. PTSD and like, you know. It just feels like it all gets platformed in such a weird way where it's like, I remember they were like Portland, they've legalized drugs and it's like this really forward thinking city and then it's like Portland's on fire and you're like, okay, fuck. Is that like propaganda to say, <laughs> yeah, right? like, Who let's knows? not have people do drugs? Yeah. Is it actually nice? Like, but, I don't know. It just seems like the, the main ones are pharmaceutical drugs now, which are like destroying like huge sections of humanity. Yeah. And it's like, uh, okay, well, I mean, heroin was around for a long fucking time. Yeah. And now fentanyl, it seems to be the thing. I don't know if it's real, though. Like, it looks fucking pretty real. What, but what? I don't know, like, if it's as... <clears throat> not like the opioid crisis. Yeah, I don't know if it's as crazy as it's being sold to us or if it's not as crazy. I think I... I, I look, I, I, I think it is. Well, I listen. I, I make an intent. I, I, I have a huge intention, especially if I'm doing this, to listen to the side that makes sense to me and then listen to the exact opposite. Yeah. yeah. And they are, they're both so compelling, man. Like they're, because they're, they're put together well and they, they're, they're trying to win you. Yeah. So you watch one and you're like, yeah, that's fucking crazy. And then you watch another and you're like, yeah, you know what? It's like, you watch the ones like channel five news or old vice. And you're like, holy shit, Mm. the world is really bad. And I'm kind of scared. And then you watch the opposite of that. And they go, they're saying this to scare you. Have you noticed around you it's pretty much fine, like your day to day? And you're like, yeah, I fucking do know that. And then <laughs> and then you then you get hit with these two things and you yeah. go, I'm just gonna have to go with it whichever just, way my bias leans yeah. and accept that that's the best I can do. Yeah. And now I'll probably just stop listening to the other side because I'm like, I don't want to well, be this that. Is, this and this, this this is why your reptile brain shouldn't have access to this one's information because mm. it can't, can't you're saying we should be more controlled <laughs> you're saying we should be more censored <laughs> we're um, just, i'm gonna pull it up i'm just gonna grab you another beer right, and we'll switch to the patreon now all right yep oh check out the new fucking album jesus oh is this is yeah i mean yeah that yeah that's definitely something yeah. worth telling people talk to about do it. yeah definitely we'll um, talk about it on the patreon but yeah. um yeah check out organism algorithm on spotify it's amazing yeah, good artwork too. The artwork's okay. Mm. <laughs> I still have a, don't have a copy of the vinyl. You're here talking about how much it. you love vinyl. It's at my dad's, at my dad's house. Mocking yeah. me. Um, uh, peace. Lovegoodpodcast.com. Plumgoodpodcast.com.